The following feature presentation is part of the Skywalking Network. Power on. It's showtime. I have the power. Boldly go where no one has gone before. Walk one, engage. <laughs> Welcome to a journey, a journey through time, space, and pop culture, a journey through a career in the special effects industry. Welcome to the Max Effects Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Topp. Welcome back to the Max Effects Podcast, where we go behind the scenes of many films, TV shows, and commercials with special effects artist Max Cervantes. This is episode 10, where Max takes us on the set of Katy Perry's latest TV commercial. Welcome, Max. Welcome back. Hey, Kevin. Great to be back. And guess what? This is our one-year anniversary. Woo! Yay! Time flies when you're on lockdown. Ooh. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, this has been amazing. I've, I've enjoyed this so much, and uh, it really has helped. It's giving me, given me something I've always wanted to do, which is to sit down and just grill you on everything you've ever done or are doing. <laughs> yes. So you've given, it's given me an opportunity to do that because you know me, I've always got the questions. And there is many other more things that will we get to talk about soon enough as soon as things come out, you know, because, you know, we have these things, you can't talk about it or show pictures from it till it's been released. And luckily this Katy Perry commercial that we did for a Japanese corporation uh, for a product called Launderin has finally been released and it's and it's up on YouTube. Yeah, uh, this one I, I've known about for a while, you know, probably we knew about this even on the last show that we recorded, but we couldn't really talk about it. So why nope. don't we go behind the scenes of Katy Perry's Launderin home commercial? Tell us about the commercial in case anyone hasn't seen it, Max. What's it about? Well, it's it, it's for a product in Japan which is kind of very much like, say, our American product, Febreze. Mm. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a multi-typed uh, laundering aid product. Uh, there's uh, one that can be as a liquid added to your detergent for the washing machine. There's another one which is airborne for like a Febreze-like for freshening up fabrics and, and the home and such. And so in this commercial... It starts off with this beautiful Dalmatian dog walking into frame, this beautiful house. So the door closes and the dog realizes, oh, good, I'm by myself. And then suddenly, poof, the dog transforms into Katy Perry. And she's wearing this beautiful uh, white latex jacket and dress and cowboy boots combo with this long white hair flip hairdo with these two cute little Dalmatian dog ears sticking up out of the hair. And she has this very surprised look. And then she starts dancing around and basically walks through the house using this magical laundering product. And whatever she sprays it on or pours it into, suddenly that object comes to life. You know, we see a, a trench coat come to life. We see a laundry, you know, washer, washing machine come to life. We see a... Uh, chair come to life this beautiful pink velvet you know chair come to life and an end table and the whole commercial ends with all of these objects coming together following Katy Perry kind of like a little parade down this big grand hallway and it's a very simple but really cute very effective commercial using one of her top hit songs as the background music and that's the commercial I'd like to see a standard prunal that poodle that turns into Christina Aguilera myself but that's uh, <laughs> Katy Perry will do um yeah. why don't we why don't you uh let's get let's dig into this um how did this project come across your desk what what what's the process well, well what happened is that I I work for a very large scenic company called Vision Scenery and they're in Silmar California and my boss Carl uh, is in charge of the special projects and model shop, which is the, where I work. And um, Carl talks with uh, prospective clients about 
jobs we might be doing and how would we approach them and everything. And, and it's, at, it's at that stage, Carl uh, will make the decision to say yay or nay to the project, whether or not he feels that whether we can do it, not so much whether we can do it because we can do anything, but it's, can we do this on the time allotted and for the budget that the client is giving us? Uh, and the time frame even wasn't a problem because we had another watch, we had another project come in in the middle of us, and we had to put the laundering project on pause for like a week while uh, we took wow. care and put out a fire on this other project we had to do sort of like pretty quickly. Anyways, and so Carl will then pick out the, the staff who work in the shop and who he feels are best situated for working on a project. We made, uh, at the beginning of the project, we made quick dummies of the two main props we were do, doing, that being the chair and the washing machine. And it was basic sort of like a proof of concept to test it out uh, because the chair, of course, has to be a puppet. Same thing with the washing machine, has to be a puppet. So we made quick dummies of them out of uh, what we call gator foam. Mm. Gator foam is like foam core, except for there's a thin plastic sheet in between the paper and the foam, which makes it even more rigid than oh, okay. paper, foam core. And again, these were just proof of concepts to quickly make dummies and mock them up. And then also so that they could be used, uh, you know, for later for other purposes, like when it came to auditioning the different people who were going to operate the objects. So, so that's how sort of like people would get selected also depending on whether other people were busy. Like if somebody else is busy, we're like, well, that person's busy. Well, we need these people. So you know, you'll pick out different people depending on. Hold on, just real quick. I want to check something. There's this is all practical. There's no CG. Oh, yeah. I well, in this. yes and no. These are practical props who will be tweaked a little bit in CGI because uh, the chair and the washing machine were going to have a very larger than life, almost Pee Wee's Playhouse flavor to them when they're mm, done. Yeah. The chair, we we put. Um, the effects crew on set they put black and white markers on the feet of the chair as well as on the chair itself where the they were going to then later in cgi uh, in post-production add eyes to the chair and uh -huh. the same thing with the washing machine where they were going to add feet and eyes on the washing machine to give them more a more playful more personality sort of, yeah more like a, a small almost like a peewee's playhouse kind of which it could have been done practically but i guess they, they they had budget for that and felt that it would just be easier to track it it, it was it truly was because i i think it looks cuter with the cgi eyes and feet but i love the fact that there's still the practical base object there and like the chair the chair has foam arms and the foam arms are made so that the puppeteer can stick their hands into the chair's arms and lift them and wave them around kind of like cherry uh from the right. previous playhouse right uh, uh, although sometimes seeing the the chair waving its arms around kind of reminded me of the lost in space robot waving his arm <laughs> danger, around. Expected, danger. exactly i expected the chair to start shouting that and such um and then you know after that you start going you show the project objects to the clients and that would have been our the two head art directors on the project and um which were these two really and really really talented japanese women who were in charge of it and uh you show them and you talk about it going okay well you know we what they like what can we change and to make it better more like what their concept is and yet also it needs to be practical so the person who's going to be inside it or operating it can safely and comfortably operate it especially with the chair because with the chair the whole back of the chair ha is sort of like hollowed out so that the person operating it can get up close to it so that right. there's not so right. much weight forward of them so it's not just such a strain on their back because the person operating the chair is actually a, a short person they hired a girl who was a very talented dancer and she basically wore black leotards and uh, knee pads and she's on her knees with with the chair strapped 
to her over the her, back. her body, right? Yeah. And she's literally wearing the chair on the front of her body with her hands in the arms of it. Right. So she has to lean back to lift the chair up off the ground mm. and then, you know, shift her shoulders and her hips to make the chair dance and move. And at some point she has to like step forward slowly on her knees to make the chair look like it's walking forward right. for different things while moving the arms. And all of this was all done on set, you know, right. live, right. as well as they had to do it uh, during the, the auditioning process. So the first dummy prop pieces were basically proof of concept pieces because the chair right. and the washing machine were going to be really difficult to build and make them light and mm -hmm. make them so that they could be operated. The washing machine, we ended up building a little sort of like a very short stool uh, with casting wheels on its bottom oh. and, a, and a foam pad so that the person inside the washing machine who ended up, it, it turned out the best way to operate it was to have the person sit on the stool and the washing machine down lower down over it. The whole back end of the washing machine was left open. Sure. But the, but the puppeteer in the washing machine was facing backwards. His oh. back was facing the front of the door okay. of the washer. Okay. But it, it actually was better. He can't see where he's going, but mm -hmm. because of his leg position, it was easier for him to push with his legs and push himself forward. And by following lines on the floor, oh. he could see where he was going because he didn't have to go very far. Most okay. of the time, he just needed to stay in place and he would lift the washing machine from two handles we put on the inside of it and he would lift it gently off of his shoulders and he would rock his shoulders forwards and backwards to make the washing machine look like it was dancing and the front uh hatch as it was a front loader washing machine the front door was also left on a hinge so that it could swing open and close and we put a small piece of monofilament on it so that the door could only open up so much and this way the door would open so much and then it would swing back and shut and you know open and close and open and close it gives a little free animation to the object okay so so before we go i want to get into the audition process but i want to do a summation at this point so sure. you guys had to do the rough designs and then you had to learn from those and start building what the actual ones were going to be and you were assigned a raincoat and yes. i'm sure you helped on some of the other things but there I want to understand where it starts to blend when you guys start figuring out, okay, this is going to be the operation and you're starting to make rough versions of this. I would assume that these, the audition for this was more than a day. No, not the audition, but uh, the rehearsing because in the commercial, there's some very, to, from, to my eye, looking at the commercial, if they just learned that in one day, then they're all super geniuses because that <laughs> looked, it looked to me like there was a lot that you guys had to work out especially casting the people that are going to do the puppeting, right? Well, yeah, we, we did a lot of the actual testing it, uh, the objects, even before the puppeteers were brought in to uh, audition ah, with the suits. Okay. And, and uh, like, well, like one of our guys, Trevor, he's kind of a short slender built guy, but he's not as short as the final puppeteer, but he could certainly try it out and, and see whether he liked it or not. And then even when the puppeteers were brought in and they were hired, we then slightly altered them to fit them even more so. Uh, but but we, we okay. did a lot of that ourselves, but in the dummy suits, because that way we could figure out what we needed the dummies to be like so that when we went to go build the nice versions of the, the puppet suit, we weren't having to re-figure everything out all over again. We'd already figured everything out in the first versions in the dummies because like with the washing machine the final version of the washing machine we built the walls of the washing machine uh out of styrene plastic but we vacuum formed the panels so it would look like the real like pressed metal panels of a real washing machine and that way all we also didn't have to paint them it would have end up having this nice machine made you know glossy white finish to them and and with the the chair the chair had to be made super lightweight but because it was going to be upholstered it also had to be made super lightweight out of wood so that the gentleman who was hired to then upholster it 
would have some place to put all his upholstery nails and staples into things. But the chair itself is not made to support the weight of somebody sitting in it. Oh, all of wow. the curved, all of the curved upholstery look to it is actually rigid, saw rigid foam, you know, sculpted hard, rigid foam. So it's lightweight, keeps its shape, but it's not really made to have somebody sit on it and, and take the weight of a human sitting in it. And it didn't have any legs. The legs are just little, you know, dummy stumps, which right. were only about three inches long. And then the effects people put black and white markings on it so that uh, the, the CGI people would be able to, um, you know, key up to the, to the stumps on the chairs to add their CGI legs. And same thing for all the different projects. Part of this process, I mean, for the different projects that were part of this, because there's the chair, there's the washing machine, there's an end table, which was an off the shelf end table that we modified so it could become a puppet. And then there was the last project, a uh, piece of this project, which was a trench coat. They brought in a very expensive London fog trench coat. <laughs> yes. And then I had to figure out how to make this trench coat into a puppet. And so we'll be posting pictures of uh, what I built for it. And I started off with some quarter inch thick black Sintra. Sintra is a trade name. It's a foamed PVC sheet plastic. It's like PVC piping, only it's made into a foam, but it's, it's a very rigid, hard foam. Not, it's not like a soft foam. It's, it, um, and so I ba basically made the body shapes, arms, uh, a torso, and then you know split it up into sub pieces. So there'd be an upper arm, a lower arm. There'd be an upper torso, and then a mid torso piece and then a lower torso, sort of like the hips area. And then the, the, the chest was bolted to the mid torso, which was then also bolted to the hip area. And this was uh, bolted together, but left purposely loose hmm. so that when it swung, the whole, the whole thing swung side to side, which is what we call free animation. And then the arms were also bolted on but left loose at the shoulders and elbows. And then I, uh, after playing around with the suit in different ways and what did it look like and what was the easiest way to get this to do what, it, what they wanted it to. Because, you know, when something is going to set, you want it to be as simple and easiest to operate as possible. You don't want to overthink things. You don't want to overdo it because Originally, I had considered putting monofilament because we used monofilament to attach everything to it to make it move as a puppet. Uh, we had attached monofilament to the hips and to the shoulders of the chest, as well as to the elbows and, and the hip and the um, wrists of the uh, puppet. But after playing around with it, actually, I discovered we didn't need the extra monofilament lines to the hips and to the shoulders just having it at the elbows and the wrist was more than enough because by pulling on the elbows hard enough, that would make the whole torso swing side to side. And in doing so, it made the lower portion of the mid torso and the hip area swing side to side as well. So you're getting all this free animation out of all this movement just from pulling on just the line that's attached to the elbow. Well, I, that, that brings up another interesting point. I've seen the, they have a behind the scenes video they released as well. We'll be posting that. And then also there's another video. When I first saw the commercial, I was like, I knew you worked on the coat. So I was going, that thing's dancing. And well, dancing well, I was like, so that means Max is groovy and can dance. <laughs> uh, and when you see it in the making of, I was like, what the heck? Look at this thing's dancing. And I'm going, well, if it's dancing, it's because of Max. I didn't know Max could dance. Well, that was, can. that was that was actually um, all part of it. I mean, when you're going to puppeteer something, you have to do whatever the client asked you to do. And I had you were asked a boogie. Well, I was I originally assumed we were going to be shooting this commercial like most commercials on a sound stage where there's oh. a, a a fly system of of you know overhead catwalks for adjusting the lighting as well as for people to go up and do things 
from up above. I thought I'd be puppeteering this from being straight up above the set. Mm -hmm. And then about four or five days before we went to set, I found out, oh no, we're filming this in a real house. And I'm suddenly like, oh, oh gosh, how am I gonna do this? How am I, how am I gonna, well, okay, there's no room for me to be directly above it. How am I gonna do this? So I went and sat back at my desk and, and sat there and pondered this uh, for about a half hour. And then it suddenly struck me. I went to our wood shop and I got some really long lengths of one by four wood, uh, some pine. Mm -hmm. And I screwed it together to make sort of an L frame shape that was really long, about 20, 25 feet long. And then I took that back to our, our shop area. We have one room we call the clean room. It's actually our break room, but we will do things in there when we need to keep things clean. And I mounted this L-shaped long piece of wood to two C-stands. Now, a C-stand, for people who don't know about it, C-stands are things you use on set to attach um, like lighting element. Like if you're going to put a, a, a filter or a, a piece of colored gel and you want it to hang in front of a stage light in a certain place, you want it to stay there. And C-stands are very lightweight, but they're very sturdy because they have a sort of like a tripod legging setup. Yeah. And they're very wide, so they can't be easily tipped over. And there's a clamp on the end of it. Right. And I use the clamps on the end of it to clamp the long piece of L-framed piece of wood. And I put that above the puppet, and then I screwed in eye hooks above the puppet for all the different lines that were going to go into it. There was going to be one line for both elbows, one line for both wrists, and uh, two lines for the hat. The hat, you can see in the commercial, also dances back and forth. Mm -hmm. And so I, I punctured the, the hat on either side, and I touched a line of mala filament to that. So all of these lines now went straight up to the L-framed piece of wood, through the eye hooks and then over to one side about 15 or 20 feet and then they came down and then when they came down is where they then attached to me i took a piece of elastic and i put it around my my head going underneath my chin and over the top of my head and the monofilament was attached to either side of my temple so if i tilted my head left or right it made the hat raise up and down same thing with there was a line with elastic going to my wrists and to my elbows uh, so that if i moved my elbows or wrists up or down it made the arms of the puppet go up and down and by pulling down on the elbows really hard it would make the whole body jerk to one side and that made the whole torso then swing back and forth and look like it's dancing and I was really, really lucky that um, on set when we were filming it, uh, one of the Japanese art directors, her name was Maki, she filmed me from behind the camera. So you see both mm -hmm. me dancing and then the trench coat dancing. And she thought it was looked so great that she filmed me. And then that's what I have. We will be showing that as well. But oh, how, yes, did, wait, we'll how did you get that. picked? How did, how did it come down to... They realized they should have one of the, one of the builders there. Well, uh, it's always best to have one of the builders there because we know how things were built. And as well as we know how we would be the best ones to know how to repair something in case something got broken. And that's sort of why you always want to have somebody who was involved in the construction to go on set. Mm -hmm. And truthfully, I volunteered. Oh. Uh, I've, I've puppeteered things a few times. And I wanted to go on set and nobody else wanted to. Nobody else wanted to go on set and I wanted to. So I said to my boss that I'd like to go. Now, you, you told us a little bit. You were surprised when you arrived. It was a house, not a, uh, not a soundstage. Uh, but to take, walk us through that. Well, yeah. So I, I, I get there on set and it was, a, it was a home, a privately owned home up in the hills in Beverly Hills, south of Mulholland. Mm. And uh, because of this, uh, they actually had us parking in another, another location and they had vans that would then drive us up to the house because you, you can't have 101 cars in this, this place's driveway because it would be blocking, oh. it would be blocking production and everything. 
And so they drove us on set to, with vans. So I had to make sure you take everything you need with you. And we get to this house and this is big, beautiful house up in the Beverly Hills. It had its own private lake with, with little paddle boats you could take out on this <laughs> little this little lake. Um, and uh, it's this beautiful, beautiful house. And we get to filming uh, first. The first thing we went started filming was actually all the sequences with my trench coat. And uh, oh. I, they, they filmed just my trench coat by itself dancing. Mm -hmm. Then we had uh, Katy Perry come in. By this time, we had taken down the heavy duty puppeteering setup for doing all the really big movements and everything. And we minimized it. And luckily, the coat rack that the trench coat was hung on had these very long arms with hooks. So I minimized the, the cords and I threw them over the hooks. And then I moved my puppeteering rig over to the side. So Katy Perry comes into the shot. Poof, she transforms into the beautiful Dalmatian. She goes from kneeling up and she sprays the stuff. And you can still see the my puppet moving in the background as she then walks out of the shot. And, uh, you know, you, you do these things in layers and pieces mm -hmm. and you, you they do it planned on okay we're going to be in this room let's do everything that's going to be in this room now so you do all of that all of that in one place and then you move on you know? and that's what they call it on set to go okay strike this area moving on to the next right and uh so you, you you keep going on and finally when we got to the sequence where they were going to film the chair which was filmed in a different part of the house in this big beautiful living room i found out why our chair had to be pink it wasn't just because they wanted it cute and girly. They, it was also because by doing it in this light pink, it matched the other furniture that was in the room because of the, the color. Oh. And Katie came on set and she saw the chair. And she thought it was so cute. And she, she looks at me because I'm helping our puppeteer get into it. And she asked, did you build this? Were you involved in this? I said, well, yes, I worked for the company that, that made this and I, I helped make it. So yes, I was involved. He says, oh, this is so cute. It's so precious. I want one. <laughs> sure. And so her, one of her people later approached me and I gave Katy Perry my contact info as well as the company's contact info saying, well, if you want one, we can make another one just like it. You know, cause she says, I would love to have one of these for my kids. <laughs> and I said, well, that, that would be great. But this one's a prop. It's not really meant for anybody to sit on it or play with it. And she says, well, that's okay. I understand. So she was really very sweet, very understanding because, you know, when you're dealing with things like this, things can go wrong, especially right. when you also have things like the puppeteers sometimes can't see exactly what they, you know, what the camera is seeing. Right. And she was, she was a real trooper about doing this whole thing. Uh, multiple takes of course mm -hmm, you know because mm -hmm. it, it takes a while to get it just right right you know so she was she was great to work with on set she was really a lot of fun so they shot yours first did you go and assist on each one were you nearby in case something... oh yes yeah i was right there every time because i was there to assist the onset prop master as well as to make sure that our stuff looked its best stayed intact you know and nothing happened to it thank goodness nothing did we were upstairs uh when we were filming the washing machine and that's how it tells you how light it was the washing machine is, is so light one person can easily pick it up right uh because it's just back and form sheets of plastic with a very light wooden frame you know uh right. trevor right. trevor and, and jeff who did the majority of construction on it they did a great job and making it really nice and strong and lightweight because uh, it had to be moved upstairs because they were going to film the, the washing machine scene in a very large bathroom. Uh, during this scene, I'm right there, just out of camera range all the time with my tools and everything, just in case, because mm -hmm. that's what you got to do when you're on set. And uh, the director called out, is there something we can do about the towels in, in the bathroom? I love the way the washing machine looks and moves but the towels hanging on the wall just kind of look dead is there something we can do about that and so maki who was the head art director we had been working with most of the time she said to me max because there's something you can do about that so i stepped into the room because they're between takes and they're changing the lighting setup a little bit 
Uh, I looked around the room and I said, well, are these productions towels or are these the towels from the house? <laughs> you know, and, and she's, oh, no, no, those are production towels. You can do whatever you want to them. I said, great. And I went and grabbed my tool bag, got out my X-Acto knife. I made a little tiny slot in the edge of the towel just beyond the edging. And mm -hmm. I put some monofilament through it. I tied it off, clipped off the excess. And then I noticed that looking at the shower stall, there was these metal hinges up about six feet up. This was a very, very tall shower stall. And I threw the monofilament roll up and over that, catching it between the wall and the hinge and the door. And then we actually shot it. Uh, I'm hiding inside the shower stall during that shot with my <laughs> arm over my head, pulling on the monofilament just to make the towel lift up a little bit and oh, look wow. like it, make the towel look alive and make it dance and move a little bit, give a little extra life. And that's the sort of things you might you know, that is to be expected that will happen at the last minute on the set. So when you're making up a toolbox of stuff to take with you on set, you have to think about what am I going to need? What might I need just in case of an emergency? Because mm -hmm. I had all the lengths for the monofilament already pre-cut for puppeteering the coat and the hat, but I took another roll with me just in case mm -hmm. I needed it for other things. And Obviously, it served its purpose because I, I did end up needing it right. or doing that last minute deal with the uh, towels. Well, that's that stuff is I love stuff like that when it's in the moment like that. But they, they, I don't think that, you know, they plan for the big stuff. Right. And then on set, somebody saw a detail and went, oh, well, what if what about this? And boom, you were there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that goes partly to the audition process because then you pick people who can think on the fly and mm. not be stuck with things. Um, since the production really didn't have some place and it was easier for them to do the audition process at our shop because we were still in the process of building these things. And so for the audition process, we used the dummy props of the chair and the washing machine so that the puppeteers could come in and use them as part of the audition process. That way they could see what that they're getting themselves into and the production could see which people seem mm, to be yeah. best suited to each object. And in the end result, uh, the two people that were hired, uh, one of them, the girl who puppeteered the chair, she was a dancer. So oh. she was really good at moving and making the chair move and mm -hmm. everything while the washing machine, while it's not really so much dancing, but being able to physically put up with lifting this thing and moving uh, it about while you're yeah. pushing yourself forward while sitting backwards. And the, the guy who was hired for the washing machine to puppeteer it, he was a jockey. He had oh, been wow. a professional jockey for many years, winning many, many big name races as a jockey. Wow, that's and amazing. So it was yeah, it was really interesting hearing his stories about having been a jockey and then what it was like then to then now being transitioning to doing this sort of work. And he said they are both so different and they're both so interesting. So he really liked it, but he was he was happy for his jockeying days to be done and over. And then uh the whole the, the whole story did Katie didn't have any input on the story like being a Dalmatian or anything. That was all done by the that was, company. I'm a ge I'm guessing that was decided by the production who were representing the the product. Yeah. Uh I mean she she even herself mentioned that normally she is a, a kitty cat because that's oh, what her fans right. are called. Right. Katie's kitties, you know, kitty cats, but she said, but Getting to be a, a beautiful Dalmatian dog for this sure. commercial was also really cute. And she liked that, which was also amazing because I had found out from listening to other people talk on set that she had just had a, a child about like only like wow. four or five months before doing this commercial. And wow, she rebounded. I wouldn't have I wouldn't have known it. Yeah. From yeah. looking at her, I wouldn't have known it from looking at her and oh, talk about her. talk. Yeah. And talk about being a good mom. I saw her several times, you know, calling home to talk with her other kids, you know, to make sure that that they were OK. And and that she's letting him know that, you know, mommy's working right now, but mommy's coming home real soon. So how many days was this to in total? Was it one day, two days? Truthfully, only two days, but it was two very packed days. Uh, the first day was 
technically a technical rehearsal, mm -hmm. but they filmed everything. And in because case. they, yeah. and yeah, just in case, and because they liked it so much, we didn't have to go back and redo things for the second day, which meant we got through the second day much faster. So, all right. My, my final question, how was the craft services? <laughs> oh, craft services is awesome. That's one of the true perks of going on set. Tra oh, craft me, services. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. I mean, if we were there early enough, you could get breakfast. And then of course there's lunch. And if you went long enough, there would be dinner oh. on the second day because we did do a little bit longer. They got craft services in to, to bring in dinner as well. And they were making fresh made Mexican. And I got myself a, a really nice chicken fajitas burrito with some rice and guacamole and sour cream. Mm. And I had, I had them make me a fresh quesadilla. I love cheese. And I went to go sit down and Maki, the head art director, called me up and she, come on, come on, sit with us, Max. It's been so much fun working, but let's all sit down and relax and have a good time now. And I was in such a hurry that I had forgotten my cheese quesadilla. Uh -oh. So I left, I left the table and I went back to go get it. And the, the chef was like, oh, I'm so sorry, but I gave it away. And then suddenly I heard this voice going, oh, it's okay. You can, you can have the rest of it. I only ate one piece of it. And I turned around and it's Katy Perry. <laughs> <laughs> she had taken your case. Taken, idea. Yeah, she had taken it since. Well, because it's my fault because I left it behind and you don't yeah. want to waste food. And she said, what's well, OK. I only took one one small piece of it because they'd cut it up into like four pieces. Yoink. You can have the rest of it if you like. And I said, OK, well, thank you very much. And she she then told me again, she said, oh, I just love I love the, the puppets you guys made us. They're so cute. And I. I Think it really is going to make this commercial and thank you i really appreciate the hard work you guys did on making those puppets wow that's great yeah well it sounds like you had a great time and it sounds i like did it was, was it great. was a lot of fun so each yes except for this so each each puppet got introduced and had sort of like its little moment first there was my trench coat and hat yeah. Then there was there was a quick little moment with it's not really a puppet, but it was a cute little prop that they built for it. It was a cuckoo clock and the little bird popped out and looked around and went back in. Then there was a, a nice little shot of the end table. The end table was a off the uh, off the shelf table that they had bought production bought. And then we had to cut off its legs and then uh, make these two sets of long metal poles going off the sides so that it could be moved. And then uh, we rigged the front drawer so that the drawer could only slide out so much. And we put it on a bungee cord. So if it slid out all the way, it would bounce and then go back in. So it was all part of the mm -hmm. turning a, a real object into a puppet. And then everything that was stuck on the top also had to be stuck down. And there was this little key top, which was a bottle of the Laundron product, uh -huh. which is meant as a air freshener. Uh -huh, so right. they had to shoot a nice close-up of that. And in, in the close-up, you see it gently wiggling the bottle, tilts back and forth. And that was a little bit of free animation because we, we basically attached a rod underneath it with two elastic bands so that the, oh. bottle would, the bottle would tilt back and forth side to side as the table was lifted and moved side to side. And then the washing machine upstairs and the laundry room. And then the whole commercial ends when you go and watch it on YouTube, the whole commercial ends with kind of a little parade where there's Katy Perry in the front and then there's the chair on one side and the washing machine on the other. And then behind them is the coat rack right. and the trench coat and the table. And so they're all kind of dancing like a little parade following Katy Perry down this grand hallway. Right. And that was, that was actually all filmed in several passes First, they filmed just Katy Perry. Right. And then they filmed the chair and the yep. washing machine. And then they filmed the trench coat and the table. So in separate passes. And then in the computer, they went ahead and they stacked them all on top of each other. Because it's a lot, it was a lot easier to try and get the individual performances by filming them all separately. Especially since, you know, most of them are actually puppet objects. And Katy Perry filming her was of course the easiest because she's a trooper and she's a great performer mm -hmm. and it was filming the chair and the washing machine and the other props 
getting them to do what made the director happy was a little bit more difficult. Awesome. Yeah. And that was pretty much the last shot for, on the last day was doing that sort of like parade bit at the very end. Where they wrapped it up. Yep. And then after they wrapped it up, the, the props got wrapped up and sent back to us. And so we still have the washing machine uh, in the office and the chair and the trench coat. And my my boss, Carl Horner, he was asking me, you know, well, he said, Max, do you, do you want the, the, the puppet? Do you want the trench coat puppet? I said, sure. Why? Are you guys going to throw it out? He said, well, we don't know what to do with it. We, you know, nobody can reuse the, the coat because it's got holes in it where you put all the monofilament lines through it. So I said, sure, I'll take it. So I still have the uh, trench coat. Excellent. Well, that, and that's what I always ask you, right? Uh, there's, I can think of many of the last 10 episodes where I'm like, do you have that still? And you're like, no, we didn't. I'm like, what? Yeah. Most of the time, it's no, but this time is one of those rare instances where I could say, yeah, I got to keep it. I'm, good. I'm just wondering if like a little Kevin popped up on your shoulder and said, get it, take it, get it. <laughs> like the little, like the little demon and angel. Yes, oh, yes, except the of, little collector uh, popped up yes, on your shoulder. <laughs> little, yeah, the little demon of Kevin, the collector told me, keep yes. that chair, keep that chair. <laughs> yeah keep the chair keep, keep, it, keep it all keep it all yeah a, a max we, did. Museum. We, we we have all those pieces and the other pieces are at work i i told my boss you should put them in the in the front lobby area it, it would look cool you know you're gonna have to do those you're gonna for the washing machine you're gonna have to do some vacuform eyeballs and eyelashes and feet <laughs> for it because right. other people are otherwise people you know what is that and the chair yeah. too needs a little vacuum eyes yeah, yeah. and a bow and would be cute yeah, okay. Yeah, because in CGI they added the pink bow on it in the yep. center of it's in the chair and the, the big but not the eyes jacket. The, the jacket was the jacket. No eyes yeah, on the, the jacket. Yeah, the jacket was the jacket, which I thought, huh, that's weird. That was oh, fun well. though. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun. All right, Max. Well, is there anything that is coming up that you can talk about without uh breaking any NDAs? Well, um, we do have something else that's coming out soon. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, you know, Paramount is doing another one of these Jackass movies, which oh. everybody seems to like. And we were involved in it in, in, a, in a way, a kind of big way, and in a different way, in a really small way. So that's your hmm. teaser. We worked on it in a really big way, but it's also a really small way. But I can't talk about it in further detail until it actually comes out. Well, that sounds like an excellent topic for a show when that does come out mm -hmm. am i right or am i right oh you yes it should <laughs> be coming out if i remember right i think it's supposed to be coming out by the end of december okay it could be pushed back but you never know with COVID. right in these times things are getting pushed around but potentially yeah. end of december yep well i'd like to take this opportunity to thank everyone once again for joining us on this 10th episode max Yay! One year anniversary! And it looks like we have many more listeners since our downloads jumped way up. We're always looking for more listeners who would like to go behind the scenes with us. So please help share the show, people. We would love to get we, we love sharing that we love sharing with you, and we'd love it if you would share with your friends and family as well. Definitely. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your pets, tell anybody. Yeah, anybody that'll listen to you. <laughs> And uh, if they do, then also tell them to visit us on our Facebook group. Uh, that's the Max Effects Facebook group page. They tell them to like us, uh, tell them to share it, whatever you can do. We, we want to get the word out about Max's amazing career, and uh, we would love to have your help. We'd also love to hear your feedback. Uh, please comment on the show. We'd love to hear your thoughts. We'd love to hear questions. Uh, or you can even direct message us on our Facebook page as well with anything you got for us, uh, please. Yeah, if there's any questions people have that they want to ask, you know, we can be more than happy to answer them on our Facebook group. And even if they have suggestions for uh, topics. Ooh, so. ooh, see, now there's something. Uh, give us an idea for a topic or something you want us to an uh, answer on the show. We'd love to hear from you. And there is another way full roundabout but it'll still get to us you can tweet us at skywalking pod and use the hashtag max effects we haven't got one of those yet who wants to be first <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> we'll see what we'll see how that works, how the Twitter machine works. We are part of the Skywalking Network. Skynet. Where you can also find other great shows like Classic Marvel Star Wars Comics and the new YouTube show Collectopolis, the Neverland Clubhouse, the Resilient Squadron, Star Wars Ologies, Talking Apes, Totally Tell Me Everything, and the flagship show Skywalking Through Neverland. Oh, and by the way, look for the new Skywalking Network YouTube show, Today in Star Wars History, your daily Star Wars history lesson. Until next time, this is Kevin. And this is Max. And, and that's, that's a wrap. wrap. And we're clear. Check the gate. Print. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody says check the gate anymore because everything is done digitally. Digital, yeah. <laughs> <laughs>